You guys ready? Hello out there. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Would you please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please call the roll. Councilman Marcoccio. Here. Councilman Dooley. Here. Councilwoman Nicholson. Here. Councilwoman Marcotte. Here. Supervisor Calavita. Here. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Our first matter on the agenda is a public hearing to consider the adoption of a local law providing for the amendment of local law number three of 2000, the vehicle and traffic code of the town of East Chester, article two, traffic regulations, stop intersection in the unincorporated town of East Chester and condense that into the following. Uh, a stop sign shall be added on Lorraine at the intersection of Myrtle and Laurel, and then a second stop sign on Lincoln Place at Myrtle as well, and both of them are in a north-south direction. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll uh, ask, I'll ask for a motion to open the public hearing and ask for a second, please. I'll move it. Second. Motion, second, thank you. Please call the roll and opening the public hearing. Councilman Marcoccia? Aye. Councilman Dooley? Aye. Councilwoman Nicholson? Aye. Councilwoman Marcotte? Aye. Supervisor Calavita? Aye. Our public hearing is open. Anyone here to discuss this? Anyone for the public hearing? Okay. You guys? Are you here for the public hearing for the stop sign? Yeah, if there's nobody, if there's nobody to discuss it, then I can Okay. <laughs> Doesn't appear to be anybody. <laughs> 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 I presume you guys are in favor, in other words. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, a lot of neighbors are in favor of this. This is something that the Traffic and Parking Advisory Board had considered. Several people had asked about it. So between all the parties convening, uh, certainly this is a good idea. And you know, I'm a big fan of stop signs. Uh, it helps safety, in my opinion. Anyway, um, so there being uh, no one to speak against and two present for, uh, I will make a motion to close the public hearing and ask for a second, please. Second. second. All right, please call the roll in closing public hearing. Councilman Marcoccia? Aye. Councilman Dooley? Aye. Councilwoman Nicholson? Aye. Councilwoman Marcotte? Aye. Supervisor Calavita? Aye. Okay, would someone care to make a motion on the action, on the local law itself? I'll, I'll move it. I'll second it. All right. Any further discussion? No, there being none, please call the roll. Councilman Marcoccia? Aye. Councilman Dooley? Aye. Councilwoman Nicholson? Aye. Councilwoman Marcotte? Aye. Supervisor Calavita? Aye. All right. Uh, those signs should go up probably tomorrow or next day. Uh, and we're also going to do some striping, and we'll do the, you know, the nice uh, uh, light reflective banner so they pop. Because that's the only hard thing about putting a new stop sign up is that people don't know it's there, and then you want to have a rear end collision. So, uh, but I think it's a good idea, and it'll, it'll be a good addition to the neighborhood. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that moves us to appointments. And uh, for appointments, we have our Lake Isle Advisory Board. And uh, on uh, September 22nd, we had our annual meeting. And at the meeting, there was uh, a, a nomination, a second, and there was a vote by uh, advisory, uh, excuse me, by uh, Lake Isle members for the following, uh, Nick Saviano, uh, Peter Soans, and Mark Woodward were all uh, reappointed and uh, reelected, I should say, and it's our position to reappoint them to the Lake Isle Advisory Board. So I'm happy to make that motion uh, and also to designate Nick Saviano as chair. Uh, all three gentlemen worked very hard for Lake Isle. Uh, we had a very productive annual meeting. A lot of stuff uh, came from the meeting, uh, particularly some irrigation for the golf course and, of course, uh, the bubbling of our pool, which we have picked up again. Peter Soans is leading the charge on that. And we had a very productive meeting with the Badger Group, uh, and we have another group, another meeting scheduled. So it's our job to get that thing up and running before the end of uh, 22. Anyway, we also want to thank all the other members of the advisory board as well, and we'll be seeing each other at the, uh, at the budget workshops that we'll schedule for November and December. Anyway, that being said, I'll make the motion and ask for a second, please. Second. All right. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. Councilman Marcoccia? Aye. Councilman Dooley? Aye. Councilwoman Nicholson? Aye. Councilwoman Marcotte? Aye. Supervisor Calavita? Aye. Approval of the minutes of the September 21st regularly scheduled meeting. Any amendments or modifications? Mm -hmm. Being none, I'll make a motion to approve. Same. Ask for a second. Second. Please call the roll. Councilman Marcoccia? Aye. Councilman Dooley? Aye. Councilwoman Nicholson? Aye. Councilwoman Marcotte? Aye. Supervisor Calavita? Aye. 
Next, we have reports of departments, boards, and commissions. We have our parking summons and VNT report uh, for September 2021. Also, our detectives report and statement of accounts we can receive and file. Chief Fonsi, anything further? Yes, thank you, Mr. Supervisor. Um, the department started our active shooter training. Um, we're participating in training with Tuckahoe and Bronxville PD, and we, uh, we were lucky enough to get the use of Concordia College the uh, vacant portion of it, so it's a really good training facility. So um, everyone will, will go through that, you know, active shooter response training and school shooting response training. There's, um, you know, a, an educational, you know, element to it and then a practical element to it. Um, Lieutenant Rosenberg had planned all that training and done a good job, so I think we had one night of it and then eventually there'll be two or three more uh, days of training and each officer will get one full day of that training. Um, we're also progressing with the completion of our new radio system. All of our portable radios were delivered. I've talked about the radio system in the past. Tuckahoe and Bronxville have already just gone over to the, to the system. There's a cellular component to each radio, whereas if for some reason an officer is not getting enough signal with his portable radio, it'll revert to the cellular system. There's a, you know, I was able to, uh, to train the, the uh, MTA police came in and gave us a you know a, a tutorial on it, and I was able to I was able to participate in that, and it was uh, really good. A lot of features to those new radios. There's um, a, a function where if one officer has his radio keyed, other officers can't you know we call it stepping on where they're trying to talk at the same time. So it's it's a very uh, good enhancement to the to the radio system for a long time. We've been looking, you know, for a really good fix that would, you know, um, cure those problems of dead spots and stuff. And this looks like it's going to be a very um, productive, uh, you know, enhancement of the system, no doubt. Um, we've also begun our um, screening our candidates for the January uh, Police Academy. So Lieutenant um, Rodriguez has been pre-screening candidates. We sent out Canvas letters and you know that's part of that process so within the next few months we'll be doing background checks interviews agility and then you know ultimately they'll have a an interview with the town board so we we, we have begun that process we we do have um, some vacancies to fill so we're looking forward you know it's a it's a brand new list we have uh, I think we had 27 original uh, people eligible, so we have a good pool of candidates to pick from, and hopefully, uh, you know, we'll get some some good new officers by January. And that's all I have. Thank you. Anything further for the chief? Yeah, chief, I, I think the uh, the car scavengers hit my neighborhood the other night. So yeah, we have had a, a few, not not um, widespread, you know, like but a, a few individual, you know, we had um, a couple weeks ago down by the Dale Road area, and then we did get a, a few complaints, but they hadn't taken much. I don't know if they were, were either scared off or, you know, but we do, again, we remind everybody to lock their cars in the driveways. I know I say it ad nauseum at, every month, but, you know, so um, it, it, it's important, you know, for people. We do, we put it out on our, our Facebook page at nine o'clock at night, before you, you know, go to sleep or watch your TV, you hit your, your remote and make sure the car's locked and not leave the, the, the new key fobs. People leave them in the cars and, you know, someone could just go in, start your car and drive away. So, you know, we try to, uh, to educate people to, you know, to try to be more careful. But uh, it's definitely an opportunity crime. We, um, we haven't had a lot of it, you know, uh, some some years we do have like widespread throughout the county where there's groups that go around and do it. So it hasn't been too widespread. It could be just like individual uh, things, but we'll we'll make sure that patrol is aware of it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Law Department, Mr. Tedisco. Yes. <clears throat> yes, the Law Department. Uh, there's a resolution on the agenda authorizing the supervisor to continue mutual aid and rapid response intermunicipal agreement between the town of Eastchester and Westchester County Department of Public Safety pertaining to the mutual aid and rapid response plan for the police departments of Westchester County. 
Sure, this is just very simple, an agreement uh, amongst probably all of the local police departments and the county department to uh, uh, reciprocate and support and aid each other in the event there's a circumstance going on that you know, exceeds the capacities of the department. And we're certainly willing to, uh, to help with that. So I'd make the motion ask for a second, please. Second. Thank you. Please call the roll. Councilman Marcoccia? Aye. Councilman Dooley? Aye. Councilwoman Nicholson? Aye. Councilwoman Marcotte? Aye. Supervisor Calavina? Aye. Okay, to bring us to the Highway Department report, we can receive the re written report. Mr. Littell, anything further to add? Good evening, Supervisor Calavita, members of the town board. I do have a few things to mention tonight. Sure. Uh, crews completed planting of our fall flowers. Our residents will enjoy these great vibrant fall colors throughout the town. Fall leaf cleanup will be starting soon. Again, we ask our residents that leaf piles be placed on the right of ways. Uh, this is of importance to keep leaves from clogging our stormwater drains and in the event of heavy rains, and also to keep our streets clear and safe for vehicle and pedestrian traffic. Uh, Monday, October 25th, our start date for our residential food scrap recycling program. The program involves separating food scraps from your household trash. Food scraps must be placed in certified compostable bags, a 24-7 drop-off has been provided for the residents, located at the dead end of Farella Way, next to our compost bin. Uh, for further questions, please reach out to our office or check out our website at highwayateastchester.org. I have nothing further to report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we can receive and file our, re our uh, receiver of taxes report for September. Also, we have our clerk's report for uh, August. Anything further to add? Well, I'll just mention that um, early voting starts this Saturday, October 23rd, at the library and runs through next Sunday, October 31st, and then Election Day is November 2nd. And if you have any questions about polling places or timing of the, when, when the early voting takes place at the library, all that information is on our website and as is a link to the Board of Election, Westchester County Board of Elections. So any questions you have, you can just get all the answers right there. Great. Thank you. Okay, correspondence. We have a memorandum from the controller on part-time and seasonal employees, uh, mostly for EIBL as our basketball season starts up. Uh, Someone care to make a motion? So moved. Second. All right, please call the roll. Councilman Marcoccia? Aye. Councilman Dooley? Aye. Councilwoman Nicholson? Aye. Councilwoman Marcotte? Aye. Supervisor Calavita? Aye. Next is a memorandum from the Superintendent of Parks and Recreation regarding a Westchester County uh, Department of Senior Programs and Services uh, funding for our in-home and contact or, or in-home contact and support services for food drop-off uh, for the program year, a part of 20 and into deep into 2021. This is for funding in the amount of $14,580 for a receipt by the town of East Chester, and I would make a motion to accept same and ask for a second, please. Second. All right, please call the roll. Councilman Marcoccia? Aye. Councilman Dooley? Aye. Councilwoman Nicholson? Aye. Councilwoman Marcotte? Aye. Supervisor Calavita? Aye. Next is a memorandum from the Lake Isle General Manager regarding our golf cart lease, and uh, each, you know, every five years or four years, we do a lease agreement for all of the golf carts that are up at Lake Isle, and it's not just um, the golfers golf carts. It's also the trams that we take people back and forth to the pool with from the parking lot and uh, multiple other gas powered vehicles that are used by the staff there and the greens crew. So uh, normally what we'll do is we'll kind of get to year four, the end of year four, and rather than proceed into year five, we will start a brand new lease again. And that has certain advantages for us in that um, the club car, the group that we use, uh, eats the rest of the fifth year and we start anew with them. Uh, also, all of this is all done through a larger uh, know, government contract that we're a part of. Um, this year, uh, what George Papadimitro is recommending is that we uh, go to a lithium ion battery, which is good for a lot of reasons. It uh, has a longer charge, has a five-year warranty as opposed to a four-year warranty, and it uses a lot less electricity to charge. Also, these new carts will have an onboard computer so that when you pull your cart up to your ball, it'll tell you how far you are to the pin, which is a nice tool, and most of the high-end carts have that on the uh, golf courses around the county. It's nice to have that, uh, that feature there. Also, we're not sure how long delivery will take, so it'd be good to have that extra year flexibility 
And if the new cards show up early, great. If they don't, then at least we have the old cards. We didn't give them up. Or we're not into post-lease terms uh, with club car. So I think all in all, it, it's a good idea. It's a five-year term at $92,188.20. The town also charges a fee for the use of the golf carts by golfers, and that varies between about $300,000 and $350,000 per year. So um, it, it basically pays for itself handsomely, and we also provide a service for the golfers, and we'll have brand new carts. So I think all around, it's a, it's a very good idea. So uh, someone care to make a motion on this and ask for a second? So moved. Second. Thank you. Any further comments? All right, please call the roll. Councilman Marcoccia? Aye. Councilman Dooley? Aye. Councilwoman Nicholson? Aye. Councilwoman Marcotte? Aye. Supervisor Calavita? Aye. Thank you very much, Mr. Papadimitro, for working that out for us. Okay, uh, next we have miscellaneous business, and election day is on Tuesday, the second, which normally would be our meeting. So, as we have historically, we'll look to move that meeting to the third, the next day, which is Wednesday. I'll make that motion. Ask for a second, please. Second. Please call the roll. Councilman Marcoccia? Aye. Councilman Dooley? Aye. Councilwoman Nicholson? Aye. Councilwoman Marcotte? Aye. Supervisor Calavita? Aye. Okay, council member reports. Councilman Marcoccia? Thank you, Supervisor. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, Rocco Lotella, our highway superintendent, for his work on the food re uh, scrap recycling program. As he mentioned, it does start uh, this Monday, October 25th. Um, we do have three large containers. They're going to be placed um, at the end of Farella Way, uh, near the, adjacent to the compost site. So anyone that is interested in using it, please feel free beginning uh, Monday, October 25th. Also, I wanted to mention that the East Chester Environmental Committee held their Green Festival this past Saturday here at Town Hall. It was very successful and it was very well attended. And I want to thank all those in the committee uh, that helped put this together. Um, they did a really good job with that. Also, Lake Isle, there's just over a month uh, more for golf with the cooler weathers upon us. So please get out there and enjoy. We got some fantastic days coming up this week. If anyone is interested in playing tennis over the winter, please contact Sport Time to take advantage of their indoor tennis. Uh, space is limited. It's been, uh, they've been doing really well there. So if you are interested in playing winter tennis, uh, you should contact Sport Time. Um, and then I, I did want to mention uh, with respect to Lake Isle, Joe Dooley and I, along with members of the Lake Isle Advisory Board, met with Steve Renzetti, one of our golf course consultants. He has provided us some guidance as we look uh, into installing new irrigation systems at the golf course, as the current one is very old and antiquated and needs replacement. And I know the uh, supervisor mentioned that a little earlier as well, but um, we are seriously looking at doing that, and um, we're going to be having some additional discussions regarding that soon. Um, with respect to the library, the Friends of the Library book sale room is now open two days a week, every Tuesday and Friday from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m., so stop by and check it out. I'm not sure if it's going to be open uh, during the um, early voting time. I think they might use that room, but nonetheless, it is open uh, Tuesdays and Fridays from 12 to 3 p.m. Um, and I also want to just shout out to the, East, the um, Columbus Day Parade Committee. They did just another great job with, with the parade and with the festival. It was just, you know, spectacular. We had thousands of people come and go every day, and um, they just did a really, really good job. Um, and also, I want to thank Sheila. Each year, she coordinates for the seniors, or East Chester seniors, a 50-50 raffle. And everyone here, including the supervisor and uh, on the town board, participating in selling those raffles. Thousands were sold, um, and many other volunteers participated with that raffle sale. So. We want to uh, congratulate our East Chester seniors for making a few dollars there as well. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Councilman Dooley. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Supervisor. Just a couple of notes. Yeah, I want to also thank the, uh, the Columbus Day Committee for a great job over the, the Columbus Day weekend, as well as the, the Green, the Environmental Committee for their Green Day event. Uh, both great events, so uh, thanks to everybody there. And then finally, I'd just like to mention that this Saturday, at 9 a.m., so October 23rd at 9 a.m., we'll be having a dedication ceremony for uh, a sitting area just outside of Town Hall for uh, uh, Councilman Glenn Belito. So to honor him, we're, we're setting up a nice uh, seating area, pergolo, 
out front and we'll have the dedication ceremony this Saturday, October 23rd, 9 a.m. So all are welcome. Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. Okay, uh, Councilwoman Nicholson. Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. Good evening, everyone. Um, we're, well, this upcoming weekend, there's a lot of Halloween fun ready for, I uh, hope you're ready. It's, uh, we start Friday evening at 5.30 with a truck or treat, which is sponsored by the Value Drugs. And participating will be the uh, three local police departments, the Auxiliary Police Department and EVAC. So um, it's never too early to have some fun for Halloween. Um, and Sunday, there's a, uh, the parade that steps off at East Chester Middle School, starts at two o'clock, and they march down Route 22 to Town Hall. There's uh, costumes, music, and goodies. So come one, come all to the uh, Halloween um, parade on Sunday. And, and a big shout out to the Columbus Day Committee. And uh, it was a lovely e weekend. I think I hit it every day. It was a very special <laughs> weekend. And, um, and uh, thank you to the Green Festival. That was uh, a very nice event uh, on Saturday. And that is all I have, thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Marcotte. Thank you, Supervisor. Just a couple of things. I just wanted to remind uh, residents that New York Presbyterian and Lawrence Hospital, uh, in conjunction with the community fund, are bringing free flu vaccine shots. Um, they will be available on Thursday, October 21st from 10 to 2, and Wednesday, November 3rd from 9 to 1 um, at Lawrence Hospital. It is ages 19 or over. Again, it's free and no appointment necessary. If you have any questions, you can call 787-6060. And then I'm just going to piggyback on the clerk's report with regard to early voting. Um, as she stated, it does start this coming weekend. Um, residents in East Chester, you can vote at the library, or quite frankly, you can vote anywhere in the county that has an early voting site. And then I just wanted to mention that at each site there will be uh, a drop-off, a secure drop-off for absentee ballots. If you want to go that route, you don't want to put it in the mail, you can bring it to one of those early voting sites. And then lastly, uh, the Board of Elections will be following all of the New York State and CDC mandates and guidelines with respect to COVID regulations. So people, residents, voters will be asked to wear masks. Uh, PPE will be on site. Um, so all of those good things. So we want to make it very easy for everyone to vote and we hope you do vote on November 2nd. So that concludes my report. Great, thank you for your own report. Uh, just a couple things to discuss. Uh, first, I want to congratulate the class of 1972 uh, of East Chester High School uh, they, in 1971, in the fall of 71, of course they graduated in 72, uh, won the state championship and the, uh, the East Chester Eagles Sports Club and the school district brought them back uh, for, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the state championship. And it was uh, pretty cool. They gave them all a small football with the team picture on it and all the guys' names on uh, the team and they recognized them on the field. The town board gave them a proclamation uh, naming that day, October 16th, and also November 20th, 1971, both days, their day in the town of East Chester. They were very appreciative. Mm. And the district also uh, cut the ribbon on a plaque uh, commemorating the, do the donations to the bleachers. And the town of East Chester participated as a contributor, uh, and particularly uh, one large contributor was Mario J. Gabelli, uh, who uh, came up with quite a lot of money uh, to, uh, to finish off the bleachers. So they, they had him on this list as well. So it was a pretty cool event, and they won their football game also for homecoming, which was nice. Also, I wanted to thank the Columbus Day Committee as well, uh, who put together a lot of hard work, and uh, there was a lot of people there, especially on Saturday and Friday, and even Monday for that matter. But it was, uh, it was a great event. Most importantly, nobody got hurt. There were no issues, no incidences. Everybody had a wonderful time, which is really the best thing of all. Also, I'd like to mention that uh, we'll be delivering the budget to the town board uh, at the next town board meeting. And right now, as we sit, we are looking at a 0% tax rate increase for the town outside. That's a 0% tax rate increase. And for the town wide budget, we're looking at 0.5% or half of 1%. 
So uh, we'll see what we can do with that. We can't knock off that half percent and have double zeros, but we're looking forward to the whole process. It's involved. We have multiple budget hearings and workshops. We also uh, are meeting with the Lake Isle crew to see what uh, you know, they have in store for the budget, and we're going to try and work that all out together to do the best thing we can over at Lake Isle, which is an enterprise fund. Um, lastly, you know, I, I suspect we'll start having snow upon us soon. Uh, I know it's hard to, to deal with that because the first couple of days we really had some cold weather. But uh, the town board will be looking at whether or not we should go with, uh, you know, a snow emergency format or just go with, uh, you know, no parking from uh, December 1st to, uh, to March. So we'll, we'll, we're going to be exploring that and seeing what we can do and, and how involved it would be to make a change, if not for this year, perhaps next year. But that's been on our table now for, uh, you know, about a year or so. We want to try to get that worked out, maybe have a little meeting on that as well. And that concludes my report and brings us to the second opportunity to address the board. Glenn? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Just give us your name and address, please. Yeah. 20 we know who you are. Drive. Yeah. Uh, I'm here tonight to speak a little bit uh, about the uh, new community center, and that's the senior center located at uh, Lake uh, Park, 660 White Plains Road. Um, I mentioned both names because it's been referenced in some documentation that it's either a senior center or the new community center. Uh, just to gain a little information about the project and its progress, so if anybody could just fill me in on what the current status is of the project. Sure, well, it's just about completed, and it probably is one of the longest projects in the, the history of the town, if not the world. Uh, we started off with multiple bids that had to be, uh, a couple were rejected, then we finally had the final bid. Then once we finally got into the ground, you know, the uh, you know, borings that were done indicated uh, subsurface conditions that were not uh, suitable for regular uh, footings. So uh, the project was halted until uh, new footings were designed. I'm going to call it inartfully the corkscrew footings had to be put in because that was all non-virgin soil. And then finally, once that all got up and running, then COVID hit. And then, of course, after COVID, there was a tremendous material shortage. So we're still waiting now, I think, for 19 weeks or 20 weeks for the front doors and the rear doors and the doors into the other facility. But uh, the bathrooms are installed. Uh, the kitchens are completed. The floor is in. The doors are up. Uh, the, the, the front is paved. The, the you know, landscape was done. Um, we still have to install a fence from the edge of that building to the edge of the locker room uh, to, you know, keep protected the generator. We put a generator in there and some other apparatus back there. Um, also, uh, the, um, the doors, I said, have to go in. Uh, there was some other miscellaneous stuff. The only thing that we're, uh, you know, going to have to work out is the front of the building has an awning for, you know, for rain and for sun protection. But I think at some point, maybe not now, but at some point down the road, we may have to go to a more substantial structure. So, uh, but other than that, we anticipate, certainly, we, we hope that it would be open by now, but certainly in the next few weeks, we'll have something going on there. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd first like to say uh, thank you very much, Linda. Uh, she's uh, fielded some of my uh, FOIA requests for some of the information. I started earlier this year. I got some, some information, some documentation, and some stuff I didn't. I know that she's currently working on that, so thank you. Um, so. I'm just going to speak on some of the information I have, and uh, please, if you can help me out, fill in some of the uh, pieces of the puzzle that are missing. So I know that the, um, the architect uh, submitted a proposal back in January 2017 for the project. He was in charge of the design, and he also, I believe, uh, also subbed out an engineering firm to do some of the uh, foundation work and some of the uh, research on that. Um, I know that the project itself went out to bid sometime in February of 2018, correct? I think so, yeah. Okay. I don't recall the exact date. Okay. Uh, and the bids were due by March 15th of 2018. Now, I know that <clears throat> this project uh, fell under Wick's law, so I know that there had to be four separate contracts, four prime contracts, one for the general contractor, one for the electrician, one for the plumber, and one for the HVAC. Um, with that said, 
I believe the proposal for the architect was $68,000 to provide some services for the project. Excuse me. And um, some of the services included a design, uh, construction commencement. Uh, he is supposed to assist in the certificate of occupancy. Uh, part of his proposal included uh, 10 construction inspections of the project, but uh, his proposal did not include any construction supervision. Uh, contract one was awarded to a Peter A. Chameleon Sons. Uh, that's a general contractor. Uh, the documentation I have shows that the contract and bid proposal form was dated March 15th for $1,535,694. Um, unfortunately, the document I received uh, had no date on the signature page. Contract number two is an electrical contract that was awarded to T&G Electric Incorporated. The bidder's proposal form was dated uh, May 16th of 2018, so I know that was past the uh, bid due date. This particular documentation I received, uh, the form contained the language of that all work had to be completed in every respect within 240 days after the execution of the contract. Uh, the contract bid proposal form was dated May 16th of 2018, and that amount was for $228,000. The execution date on the last page of that form was dated May 16, 2018. Uh, however, the notarized form uh, signed by the supervisor is dated July 24, 2018. Uh, and this particular document uh, is the only one that had bid tabs attached to it. I requested some bid tabs to see what items were being bid on. Um, I'm not sure why there were different dates on that. Trying to, trying to fill in the blanks as to why the, there was a, the notary date was different I, from the I'm execution not sure. date. Okay. Uh, contract number three, the plumbing contractor, was the contract was awarded to SNL Plumbing and Heating Corporation. The contract and bid proposal form was dated on May 7th of 2018. That was for $295,000. And the execution date on the last page of that form is May 7th of 2018. I didn't have any uh, bid tabulation information on that. The language in all of these documents state that the work shall commence and be completed in accordance with the bid documents. And the bid documents have a 240 day stipulation for completion of the work for each contract they're bidding. And contract number four is the HVAC contractor. That was J&M Heating and Air Conditioning, Inc. The contract and bid proposal form dated May 15th of 2018 was for $278,000. And the execution date on the last page was March 15th of 2018. The total for the project came out to a little over $2.4 million. Um, I know you were explaining some of the bid process that there were, I believe, some unresponsive bidders. No, the, uh, the first time out, or the first or second time out, we thought the numbers were too high. We said, wait a minute, this can't be right. You know, because you, you go out there, you listen to people, they tell you, oh, this should be about this, this should be about that. You go to bid, and I'm like, uh, no, nah, I don't think so. This has exceeded our expectations. And then we ended up realizing that, you know, no matter what we calculated, we had to go up in price, so we bid it again. And I, I think there was two bids, maybe there were three. I'm not really sure, actually. But I know at least twice it was bid, and, uh, you know, we ended up with more realistic numbers on our end. Okay. A couple of questions I have. Again, it's just to fill in some of the some of the blanks that I have because I don't have all the, 
the documents. Um, was there any resident project representative assigned to this, an advocate for the town? Yes. To oversee? Jim Solomine was assigned to the position. Okay. He was on the job every day, coordinating, advising us, making sure that, you know, the place was secure and that things were getting done to okay. the best of his ability. So the 240 day stipulation in the contract, how did that play out? Because it's 240 days from the date of execution of the contract. How did they time the, the work? Obviously a general contractor can't work over the electrician or the HVAC. How, how did that work? Because in the, in the language it said that they had to be completed within 240 days of that executed contract. Well, it, it, it didn't work that way. It, that might have been what it said, but you know, it didn't work out that way. We ended up with the footing issues and all kinds of problems that slowed the job up. Everybody was uh, doing the best they could, but it had to be redesigned, which you know, was not, uh, it was much to the consternation of the town. But when you're told that it cannot continue unless it's redesigned and re-engineered, you have to do that, otherwise you can, you can abort the project and then you go back out to bid again and you have to go you know, right back to the beginning. And it's strangely, to the best of my knowledge, this same group of, of contractors bid the first time and the second time, and possibly the third time, if there was a third, if I recall. In other words, this, this is the same group of people that we were dealing with time and time again. And, and these foundation issues didn't come up in the design? Not in the design, no. They had to be, when, when they finally got in, to the job site, they saw that this stuff was not, you know, the, I'm, I'm, I'm not using hard for words, but that the soil was not virgin, so it was not compacted soil. It had been, it would have been filled that was placed there and was not, not, I don't know, not suitable for your standard below frost uh, footings, if, that, that's, if that's the right way to say it. Okay. I, I don't have all the documents in front of me. I just found that it, it was a little odd that they didn't know that from its origin going in. If you're going to place soil there and you're gonna compact it, you're gonna have an idea what the soil capacity is going to be. So that's why I find Well, they, I think they, when I think they had done, they had done calculations, uh, but you know, when they actually got on site and started excavating, they realized that that was not, you know, it wasn't suitable. Then, you know, I said to them, listen, you gotta figure something out here. So you gotta do some borings, do something. I'm not sure what the, technique is to check compaction rates. Normally it's a boring, I think. But uh, that was done and then they had to re-engineer everything. And you know, it was immensely frustrating. But whether it was happening at that time or we canceled the contract and did something else, it still had to be re-engineered anyway. And this, the, whatever you know, piles were put in you know, uh, had to be re-engineered and, and installed no matter what we did. So we decided to continue with the job rather than abort. Okay, like I said, it's a little difficult uh, just to understand why that wasn't picked oh, yeah. up very early on. Okay. It should have been. Okay. Um, were there any notice to proceed involved in this? I'm sorry? Project, notice to proceed. Did you issue any notice to proceed to any of the prime contractors? I'm not sure what you're referring to, but... Uh, that, would be, that would be from the town giving the contract, that whoever was awarded the contract, that you have a letter, it's a notice to proceed, it said you have 10 days to start, and they have to start within those 10 days because that's when the, that clock starts. Clock starts ticking. Um, I'm not sure. I'd have to check with the law department or with... Uh, you know, uh, 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 Jim Solomine, our, our, our uh, contract guy, you know, our manager, but uh, we all, we had multiple pre-construction meetings and everybody got on the same page and everybody decided when they were going to start, what was going to happen, who was going to clear, that there was, there were tons of meetings about the, you know, the initial uh, uh, shovel in the ground, so to speak, getting the project off the ground. So, you know, I'm not sure if there was an actual letter to that effect, but certainly everybody was on the same page with regard to who was doing what, when to get the ball rolling. Right, because that's usually the, the instrument that documents, Trigger. hey, right. it's time for you to start going. The clock is running now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, were there any change orders to this project? Because, sure. again, I don't have any documentation. Uh, yeah, I'm still we, waiting. We, I know Linda's We approved a couple that. in the past. 
but you know there are several that are presently uh, uh, you know uh, sought by the contractors, and based upon our level of frustration with regard to the progress of the project, we've advised them we're not paying any change orders until we have the project done, finished, completed, uh, and we also have. Uh, you know, I guess, I guess all of the trades had their various change orders. Some were a result of the project site, some were a result of things that weren't figured into the architect's plan, some were just, you know, uh, improvements that we had made. But uh, we're going to run through that once we are finished with the construction process. Also, um, <clears throat> with regard to change orders and regard to the, whole, the overall budget, we were advised uh, years ago that uh, a, w a woman, a lovely gal, that was at the senior center had left the town uh, the sum of $300,000 plus uh, in her will, which is really quite nice, quite kind. So, uh, you know, that's all part of our budget and we'll go into the assessment on the change orders. But I suspect there'll be a lot of haircuts happening uh, at the change order meeting when we meet with everybody. And your you, term of art I use, of course, you would you recognize. Okay. And uh, one of the change orders may or may not involve this pile situation. Oh, I'm sure they were called helical piles. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure if we had authorized that. I, I don't recall, to be honest with you. I know we had a few in the past. Uh, you know, the fire department had required, they wanted to have some, um, some different plumbing on board for the sprinkler system. Con Ed, of course, always has their legion of demands that they make, as did Suez Water. But, uh, you know, we, we have a list. We're going to, you know, end up, it's going to have to be completed, processed, reviewed, but, uh, you know, they're all, they're all coming in now. Okay. Um, who actually advised the town to enter into this type of contract? I'm sorry? Uh, who advised the, the town to enter into this type of contract? Not, not the Wix law part. Obviously, you're obliged to, uh, to uh, follow that law. Who advised the town that this type of contract well, was, is? It was the town's idea to create this building, and uh, I'm not sure where the initial draft of the contract came, but the town prepared bid documents, uh, and from the bid documents come the contracts. So I, I, I presume at some point the architect or his engineer or someone probably put together this, you know, the initial draft with the review of the town attorney, of course. Okay. I ask this because uh, in whatever research I was able to uh, do with the documents I had. I noticed that in this contract, or any of the contracts for the prime contractors, there were no liquidated damages. There was no clause for liquidated damage, so um, why wouldn't that be in this type of contract? Well, to the best of my knowledge, liquidated damages will come into effect, A, when they're put in there, but also uh, with the time clock, you know, with the 240 days, that's when you assess your damages. But we weren't in a position to enforce that because of the delays regarding the footings and everything else. So we, we had to absorb some of that. We can't say to people, you know, it's like, it's like the old clause about subsurface rock. If you hit subsurface rock, everything stops, everything changes. And that's what essence happened here. Uh, but notwithstanding all of that, we still wanted to move forward with the project. We just had to reconfigure and re-engineer the, uh, the, the, uh, the piles. Well, not the piles, the, the footings. Okay. I ask about the liquidated damage because I've reviewed many contracts for counties, villages, towns, and every one I review has liquidated damages built in to the contract. It's just a, an extra level of safety uh, to ensure that the contractors are going to deliver a product in the appropriate amount of time. Yeah, but, but you're correct to a certain extent, but liquidated damages are often tempered by acts of God and by other issues like COVID, like material shortages. So all those things obviate any liquidated damages claim you might have. It, particularly, like I, I wouldn't categorize the subsurface conditions as an act of God because they were created by the town back in 1970, you know, 78, 79, whatever it was. But a, a lot of that, uh, you know, is vitiated by the conditions that we found ourselves in. And frequently, you know, a lot of times you, you can ask Jim, we want to throw the plumber off the job or the electrician off the job and say, what's going on? What's taking so long? You know, 
But the problem with that is, as you know, then you have to go to bid again. The job has to stop completely until the bid process is in effect. Then you have to start all over again, and, and that, that we weren't in a position to do that. Besides, the same group of guys, the same electricians were the ones that bid each time. Right. Again, I, I speak about the liquidated damages because that usually is the leverage that the town has right. to keep people on track, and, and it was not in this contract. Mm -hmm. So there's really no leverage to keep them going. So the only other fail-safe you have may be a performance bond. Uh, did anybody uh, look to pursue the performance bond? If the I, I, contractors weren't performing, uh, that's what that's there for. And the performance bond is designed to make you whole. So that if correct. the contract is not performing, that bond is in place to make it you whole for the value of that project. That's true. I, I, don't, I can't speak to that. I'm not sure about that. I haven't looked at the agreement in quite a long time. Uh, but at this juncture, we are under budget, not, you know, notwithstanding the extras that we have, but still, you, know, you, make, you make a valid point. But what I'm just trying to, 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 to convey to you is that notwithstanding the fact that you had a liquidated damage, you still had these unique circumstances that the whole world was living under with COVID and all this other stuff that, you know, that puts a chilling effect on any claim you might have. Further, uh, you know, the process is such with regard to Wix law that you can't, you can't just throw somebody off the job. You can't just get the hell out of here, you're done. You have to go back out to bid again, and that messes everything else up. And then what happens is you get a person that's going to point the finger at the other contractor and say, uh, 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 he did that, not me. I'm not responsible for that. And you have a whole big mess, and it makes it even more difficult to get the, get the job completed. But luckily, we're at the 99-yard line right now, thank heavens. And hopefully, we'll, we cross the touchdown line in a couple of weeks. Okay. Again, if there were liquidated damage in place, that's an extra level of of uh, safety and protection for the municipality, and it's to keep the contractors on track. And when that doesn't work, or when now you've gone beyond the uh, time for the project of 240 days, uh, and the contractor starts getting penalized, uh, anywhere from 500 to whatever, I've seen $2,000 a day, it kind of puts them in a position where they're gonna wanna move and get this project done for you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's the end goal, sure. is to get the project done. Uh, and I'm pretty sure if you went to pursue the performance bond, uh, whoever's behind that bond is gonna really make sure that contractor will get back on that job site to complete the project, because obviously, they don't wanna pay out on the bond. Of course, of course. So that's why I, I, I ask about this liquidated damages. Um, my concern was protection for the taxpayer. And obviously, with these projects, we're looking for a usable unit of work at the end of the day. You're paying for something, you want to have something for the community in a timely manner. And that's why you have liquidated da damages in place to make sure it moves along. So you do end up with that usable unit of work at the end of the day. So. That's why I bring that up and, and uh, strongly emphasize that. Um, Councilman Marcoccia, I know that you were the liaison <coughs> up at Lake Isle. Do you have anything extra to add? I think, you know, when you look at the, you know, when it started, the delays that Supervisor Calavita articulated regarding the, the bid process, and then when you, when you, you know, fast forward a little bit. When we had the issue with the footing, um, that was a delay. And then there was also a delay with steel. So it's not like, okay, let's fix the issue um, tomorrow. You know, we, we, we identified the issue and then we needed to order the material and there was a delay in receiving that material. So the liquidating damages in that particular case wouldn't necessarily work because you can't tell a contractor to do work if you don't have the material to do it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the process, for as much as we wanted to advance it as quickly as possible, and, you know, I was there plenty of times, supervisors was there plenty of times, it's just, you know, you could have been there. It's a hard thing to do other than say, hey, get out of here, which we can't do because of the reasons the supervisor articulated, Wix laws and, 
and a whole host of other issues. So under the circumstances, the delay with the steel, um, the work order changes that came because of the utility companies, um, COVID, which snuck in there for about a year or so, which slowed things down. It's, uh, it was a challenging time. It definitely was. But the good news is it's going to be there for the next 50 to 100 years at a minimum. It's a beautiful building. It'll be done in a couple weeks, and everyone's going to enjoy it. So I, I would just add this, if you don't mind. Um, and, and I know you, you spoke that you review multiple contracts at different levels. So this is probably something you're familiar with. But it is not uncommon that when you bid a project, um, at, regardless of the level, right, village, town, county, state, um, that you end up bidding it multiple times. Because you know, your, your first crack at it, you're, you're working with consultants, you're looking at sort of back of the envelope numbers, if you will, you're putting together what you think this project should come in on, you know, based on obvious prices and economics, and many times it comes in way over. So you go back, you rebid it, you redo it, as the supervisor mentioned, the same players bid on it again. Sometimes they come in even higher, sometimes they back it off and come in lower. It, it's a competitive you know, structure, if you will, but it's not uncommon. Um, many, many, many times that's the process you have to go when you're trying to complete a project. But as, as Councilman Marcocci has said, I think the important thing is it's being done. Um, it's being done below budget, which is certainly in the best interest of the taxpayers. I know the seniors are delighted to get in there, and I think we're all just hoping the doors come in. Yeah. In the next couple of weeks, <laughs> if we, not we, this week. So, you know, okay. it, it's a great project, and a lot of people worked very hard. A lot of the work was done in-house, right, instead of farming it out to other people. So a lot of people worked hard on that project, and it, it's certainly something to be proud of. I mean, we, we had to wait for Con Ed for two months to get a pressure test, and then they gave us the wrong specs on whatever valve that had to go into the uh, fire suppression system. It was another, uh, you know, whatever. I, I don't know the exact terms of art, but, you know, it was, it was a just a protracted project. But fortunately, we're at the end of it now, and we're going to be uh, oh, using the building in the next few weeks, which would be nice. Well, thank you. And thank you for your comments, too. And uh, if I could just add. Yes. Sometimes when you have things going out to bid many times, you really have to review things, and, and I appreciate no that. Yeah. But that's also a clue as to what's going on with the scope of the project. So you really have to take a look at that. Sure. And part of that process uh, is also dealing with a good consultant who's going to guide you and tell you what the project cost should be. They're, they're there as, as an advocate for you and steer you in the right direction. You know, if I could add too, generally speaking, when we do a project, we bring a contractor in to give us an idea, because they're really the ones that tell you how much something costs. With all due respect to engineers and architects, the contractors are the ones that give you the accurate prices. True. In this particular case, we were pouring a slab and putting a prefabricated building on. So, you know, relying upon the architect for pricing uh, was, you know, generally a, a, a prudent thing to do. But he came in a little bit light. That's why the first bids, I think, we thought were a little bit light. Uh, they came in more than we anticipated. Then we went out again. And I'm pretty sure we, we did it a third time, if not the second time. So, you know, it, 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 you figure a simple structure would be a little bit easier. Then you realize that you have the footing issues. Then, of course, prior to when the building should have been built, because of delays, we ended up in the COVID vortex. And then we end up with, you know, the whole supply chain drama that everybody's crying about. I, mean, I don't know whether it's truthful or not, but, you know, fortunately, the place is dry. It's completed, the floors are in, the doors are in, the windows are in, the TV's up, you know, it, it, we have all the furniture like, you know, cleaned up and dried up, ready to go up. But again, it's been a very, very long project. And you know, much to our disappointment, it took a long, much longer than it should have. You know, the seniors were down at Tucko Community Center for a while, then COVID hit, they weren't anywhere. Now at least we have them back in a building, thank God. So they're, you know, they're getting together, they're, you know, rekindling their, uh, their relationships, and, and they're going to migrate into this building shortly. But uh, you're right, do they, you do raise some valid points. Thank you. And uh, Councilman Marcoccio, to, to your point about ordering materials and having it in backlog, there was a lot of structural material that was sitting out in the parking lot for quite some time on the ground. And uh, I, I know that was also in the specifications that uh, 
the contractor is also supposed to protect the material. Why structural members were sitting out there for such a long time in the element uh, is really not good for, uh, for the project. Well, I know there may have been some delays, but, but for sure, yeah, a lot well, of the members know. were, were sitting out there. Right. Yeah. Thank but, you, Glenn. Yeah. So, uh, uh, one other thing sure. is I know that the town entered into some sort of construction contract for the highway department building recently. Uh, yeah, we, we had, we committed funds to design a highway building, uh, you know, the, the highway yard, uh, I don't know if you, you, you're aware of it, I'm sure, but for the public at home, the, the, uh, the place, the, the garage where the stuff is repaired, vehicles are repaired and everything is, you know, uh, examined, um, is too shallow. It's not deep enough to put a whole rig in. So uh, in the wintertime, they have to repair vehicles, the large garbage trucks, hydraulics, hoses, valves, whatever it goes, would have the vehicle sticking out in the back. So the, the issue was to extend the structure so that a full vehicle could be worked upon inside the building and that we could, you know, take advantage of not letting heat go out the window and, uh, you know, n more lighting, hydraulic traps, all kinds of fluids and stuff could be trapped better, better, better stuff for the environment, a little safer work environment. So that was the whole process behind that. And that's in the design stage right now? I believe so, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, just reflecting on, on the senior center, it's been three years and seven months. I realize we've gone through a pandemic. So you make allowances for that. Even with liquidated damages, you make allowances for catastrophic things that occur. Uh, the liquidated damages are for normal business of, are you showing up to the job with ample personnel to complete the job or not? So that's why I bring up the three years and seven months. It's Excuse me. definitely a, too long of a period of time. Um, I, hope, I hope that when entering into another contract, for the construction for the highway department, you, you um, look at some of the language. And uh, I hope that um, you take into account to please protect the taxpayer, uh, have language in there to protect the taxpayer, and um, to have a un usable unit of work delivered in a timely fashion. Well, we've never had an issue in the past. This is the only time we've had ever, ever had an issue. And fortunately, we're under budget and we'll be, I wouldn't say on time, but we'll be done soon enough. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Have a good evening. Anyone else? Oh, there being none. Uh, somebody uh, can make motion? a motion? Favor? Aye. Thank you.